This is a short lesson to discuss consoles. Some of you might be familiar with consoles, particularly if you have worked with Linux. Now, this topic strays a little bit from embedded systems, but as consoles are very often used for embedded systems, I thought I would talk a little bit about it. I'll give an introduction to consoles and explain why they are useful. Then I'll discuss connecting a console to an embedded system. I always like to look at old pictures of computer stuff, and here are some of old consoles. This first one is from a DAC PDP-8 computer, which is a little before my time, probably the 1970s. All it had was LEDs for output and these switches for input. Now, this console is from a DAC VAX computer from the 1980s, which is when I started my career. And the console would just be this terminal sitting on top. Now, today's console is typically a program like Putty running on a laptop. One thing nice about this is you can set up the program to store all console activity uh, in a file. So if you have any logging coming out of your system, it would all get saved. Now, what is a console? My definition is it is a direct and low-level human interface to your system and is mainly for use by developers and technicians. But depending on your product, it could be used in the field and maybe even by customers. For example, customers might use it for certain infrequent tasks, like installing software updates on a system with no network connection. Most of the early embedded systems I worked on didn't have consoles because it cost money to add a UART for a console, and the UART also takes up board space. But with system on chips, consoles for small embedded systems can be cheap, nearly free. You probably have a spare UART, and you just need a connector. And that connector doesn't even have to be populated on production boards, but it might be. Debuggers, like the one in the IDE we use, are great for code development and unit testing, but can have issues on a live system, especially on real-time real systems. It is sort of scary running a debugger like this. Obviously, you cannot do anything that will cause the CPU to stop or the system will crash. And it is not always clear what the debugger is doing, um, how it is interacting with the system. My experience is I would usually crash the system when using a debugger, but the trick was to get the information I need before the crash. Now, we can't forget that consoles require software development, and this work is often viewed as overhead, but it can pay off in the end. Here are some of the useful features of consoles. First, Using the console has low software and hardware requirements. Typically, you just need a serial to USB cable and a laptop running software like PuTTY. A console is generally not intrusive from a hardware viewpoint. Hooking up a serial interface normally has no effect on the system. A console can be minimally non-intrusive from a software viewpoint, if it is well written and used intelligently. The main thing is you don't want the console competing too much with the application for resources, like CPU time. And if there are dangerous console commands, the user has to know when and when they can't be uh, run. A console is useful by both developers and non-developers. In some places I worked, Systems in labs always had consoles connected. This allowed people working with the system, such as hardware developers and system testers, to get information from the system. And finally, with consoles, there are possibilities for remote debugging. You might have remote console connections to your lab. Or a technician in the field might be able to hook up their laptop to the console and work with you on a problem. On this slide, we go through some examples of how you would connect a console to your embedded uh, system board. Traditional consoles 
used an RS-232 serial connection. RS-232 normally uses 9-pin or 25-pin deconnectors. They're called deconnectors because they are sort of shaped like a, the letter D, if you look, look at them from the end. Now, sometimes the embedded system board has a standard D connector, but sometimes it has a smaller non-standard connector to save uh, money and space. I won't describe the scenario in any more detail because it is rarely used these days. A common problem is that true RS-232 requires positive and negative voltages, and this adds cost to adding a console connection to an embedded board. A common serial connection today uses 5 volt or 3.3 volt signals rather than RS-232. These voltage levels are referred to as TTL which is a type of electronics technology. Now, there is a company called FTDI that makes an extremely popular chip uh, used to make an adapter cable that goes from serial uh, TTL to USB. The software driver for the USB adapter creates a virtual serial port on the laptop, which would be a COM port in Windows. You then use a program like PuTTY to connect. This type of, uh, or the type of connector used for the console and the embedded system board can vary. So t sometimes you would need to solder a special connector onto, the, onto this USB adapter. The one thing to be careful about is voltage levels. TTL used 5 volt signals originally, but over time, much hardware has moved to 3.3 volts. It can ruin hardware if you connect a 5 volt output um, to a 3.3 volt input. So you need to check the specs. Now, with the Nucleo board, we have the ST Link uh, module or subboard, which has a very nice feature for consoles. Besides providing the debug interface, the ST-Link subboard acts like a TTL serial to USB adapter cable. It connects to the UART, or serial port, on the Nucleo MCU to a um, virtual port on your laptop that is running stm 32 cube IDE. You then use a program like PuTTY to connect, and this is what we'll do in this course. So that's it for consoles. Once again, thanks for watching.